Okay. Hi. Here I'm back. In the last chapter, I told you something. What is a fluid? And I talked about a continuum. What is continuum mechanics? Continuum mechanics means you have always one volume for which you make all the calculations. Okay. Now we have to have a look at state variables. And I, I want to mention before I start this chapter, you might know all the state variables from your physics classes, but I want to mention them again because they are really important here in fluid dynamics lessons. And I can also tell you, we will not have so many state variables here now. We have other more state variables in physics and in thermodynamics, but in fluid dynamics we concentrate only on a few state variables. So what are state variables? For example, there's one, the, the most important state variable and I think you know it from your school, till, till your school time, it's a temperature. Yeah? We can measure the temperature in degrees Celsius, we can measure it in Kelvin, and we can measure it in Fahrenheit, and there's even some more units for the temperature. Yeah? There's even one unit that is only used for the temperature of cheese. Yeah? That comes from history. Um, if, we, if we talk about physics, uh, I think all of you have to know how to calculate from uh, degrees Celsius to Kelvin. Yeah? If you want to do this, you just add <coughs> 237.15 degree Kelvin to calculate from the temperature in centigrade. So for example, if you have a temperature in Celsius of uh, 20 degree and you want to have the temperature in Kelvin, you just add 273.15 to 20. And then you get 293.15 Kelvin. Okay, so the temperature is most important uh, property state variable. Then we have another state variable that is really important for all our fluid flow problems and that's also something you might already know. I hope you know it as I, if you want to get an engineer, you have to know it. It's a gravity constant in meters per square seconds. And how big is a gravity constant on Earth? It's about 9.81 meters per square seconds. And now yeah, you need it for many calculations. It has to be introduced. And maybe one thing has to be mentioned. It's a bit boring if we use a gravity constant here on Earth for our fluid dynamic simulations, because it's always the same. But if you go to space, for example, if you want to build a spaceship and fly to the Mars or to Moon, you have the gravity constant changes. Yeah? So if you build a fluid machine or fluid energy machine here on Earth, it might not work on another planet because you have another gravity constant. Okay, it makes it maybe a bit more fancy now. So, another thing I want to mention is yeah who in who let's say discovered the gravity constant it was done by Isaac Newton and that's also something I want to do here in this lecture if I teach you something about fluid dynamics some background I always want to mention some historical person from time to time and want to explain who discovered, for example, the gravity constant. And this was done by Isaac Newton. He was a famous scientist in the, in the 17th century. And he discovered a lot. Yeah, not, not only the gravity constant, he also built a lot of telescope models or did a lot of fluid dynamic, um, also fluid dynamic theory. Yeah? I will mention this a bit later again. 
So then there's a big important uh, state variable. You will always need it here. It's a so-called density. Yeah, it's uh, we we take the Greek symbol rho, rho, and uh, the density has a unit kilograms per cubic meter. And you say, huh, that's easy. I always want to deal with water, and then I just take uh, the, the density of one of thousand kilograms per cubic meter. Uh, water and that's so easy but here we want to to look a little, little bit closer at this problem at this problem yeah we want to have a closer look what's really happening and if you deal with fluid dynamics and if you go in detail you have to be honest and I have to mention the density will not always be equal at every point yeah if you have if the temperature changes or if the pressure changes, or if you have another fluid, the density will change. For example, the density of diesel oil is much lower. It's, it's about 820 kilograms per cubic meter than the density of water, which is 1000 kilograms per cubic meter. And it gets even worse if you, it's, it's the density will change by the temperature and the pressure. And if you now, uh, for example, want to look at boiling processes or at, at some, some fluids that flows from a hotter region to colder region, then we have to change the density here in this calculation. And this makes it sometimes really, really tough to find out. And here we I also want to mention tables. How can we solve this problem? In many cases, you have to look at tables which conditions we have and to find the right density for your problem. So here is an example of such a table. Yeah? For example, yeah, water at one pressure, for example, one bar. And if you change the temperature, the density changes. Yeah? And if you have seawater, where, where you have salt inside the water, the density changes, or if you have air and fluid, the density changes a lot by the pressure or by the temperature. Now yeah, you know this, otherwise a balloon will not fly. Okay, so if you have a look at the density of liquids, I also have to mention something which makes fluid dynamics even more complicated. We can have so-called incompressible fluids and compressible fluids. What does it mean? What is an incompressible fluid and what is a compressible fluid? Yeah, let's start with the incompressible fluids. They are a bit easier. Yeah? If a fluid is incompressible, you can't compress it. Yeah? If you make a higher pressure, if you some, some have a piston or a cylinder and there's water inside, if you press and press and press, you can't compress it. So volume will never get smaller. You get, get a higher pressure, but you can't compress it. Uh, that's an incompressible fluid. And when you have an incompressible fluid, the density change will be not so high with the temperature. Uh, now we look at our another important fluid, air or steam, yeah, from uh, from steam engine, and this behavior of gases is totally different. Gases are compressible. You know it maybe from the pump of your bicycle. If you if you go with a thumb on the pump of your bicycle and you pump, you pump, you you have a lower volume, you compress the volume, then you get a higher pressure, of course, yeah, you feel it on your thumb, you can get a smaller volume and you can compress the, the gas. And that's a big difference if you compare an uh, incompressible fluid like water to a compressible fluid like gas. And let me tell you, if you come to the exercises and you have to do some calculations, um, compressible fluids are always more difficult to calculate 
if you compare them with incompressible fluids. And uh, what does it make more complicated? If we have compressible fluid, we have the so-called ideal gas law. Yeah? I show it here to you. P. Yeah, we have O. We have uh, O is P divided by the gas constant by temperature. And um, let's have a bit closer look at the, at the ideal gas law. What does it mean? Yeah? And let me tell you, we don't have this complicated behavior if we have incompressible fluids like water or, or oil. Yeah? They just have the constant density, or more or less. Yeah? So, but if we have a gas, what happens? If we have our bicycle pump and we put it down, we can compress the gas and here this behavior is described by Boyle Mariotte's law. That's the ideal gas law, more or less. We have the pressure, and we have, if, we, if we get higher temperature, we get a higher pressure. Or if we get lower, lower volume, we also get a higher pressure yeah, if we compress it. Okay. Or that's another description of it. If we have yeah, like maybe think about your pot. If you cook something, if you have a, have a air and water steam inside the pot, you make it hotter. It also expands. The volume will get bigger. You get faster movement of the molecules, and you will get higher pressure. That's also the same law, the ideal gas law. Okay. Ah, let's go a bit faster here. So here's the summarization of uh, first was ideal gas law, but to make it a bit more complicated, the reality is not so easy as it is described by Paul Marriott's law. Yeah? Reality is a bit more complicated, and in general we have also real gases. Yeah, we need so-called real gas factors to describe a realistic behavior. That, yes, some gases or some, uh, some steams don't behave ideally. They don't, they don't have linear behavior like described in the ideal gas law. They have 10 times more complicated behavior. Okay, and this behavior depends very much on which fluid we have. If we have steam from water or if we have steam from gas or if we have steam from methane or methanol, or if we have methane, propane, butane, they all behave different if you compress them. This makes it sometimes tough. Yeah? Okay, so let's summarize this point. We can have compressible or incompressible fluids, and for you as a student, Incompressible fluids like water or oil are easier to calculate. If it comes to compressible fluids, it's getting a bit tough. Yeah? Incompressible fluids more or less have a constant density. Compressible fluids more or less have a non-constant density. That's a big difference. So, then we come to another state variable. Nah, it's not so really important here, but I want to mention it. One state variable is also the speed of sound. Yeah? I, I, I showed you something about density. Density is a state variable and it changes if you change the temperature or if you change the pressure or if you have a different fluid. And also speed of sound is a state variable and it depends on your fluid. The speed of sound in water is different than the speed of sound in air. Yeah? Uh, fishes or dolphins can hear much faster than we do in air. Okay. And the state, if you have a speed of sound of special fluid, you can also calculate the Mach number. The Mach number is the velocity inside the fluid divided by the speed of sound of the fluid. 
So the Mach number is really characteristic. So we have a Mach number higher one, we have supersonic flow. Okay, and maybe uh, let me also mention we will not have too many calculations with supersonic flow problems because it's getting a bit tough in this point, getting more complicated. Yeah? If you have subsonic flow, it's easier to make the exercises. If you have supersonic flow, it's getting more complicated. Okay. So more or less, we want to calculate our problems in low Mach number regions. And last but not least, important variable that I have to talk about is the pressure. Pressure is our old friend, it's an important uh, value. We can have the units bar or pascal or even newton per square meter. That's the definition also of pascal. And what does the pressure mean? Here we have a gas, we have a pressure inside. And we have a wall here with an area. We have a force acting on this area depending on the pressure. If we have a high pressure inside our vessel, we will get a high force on our surface. Okay, and more or less, uh, I think in many cases we will calculate with the unit Pascal. It's a really convenient unit. Uh, it's a really small unit. Uh, maybe you know the unit one bar. Yeah? One bar is our atmospheric pressure here on Earth, yeah? on the surface of the Earth. But if you do the calculations, we often use the, the unit Pascal because Pascal is just the same as Newton per square meter. That's really easy to calculate it to Newtons. Okay, yeah, let's have again a little historical ex excursion. Um, have a small look at uh, why, why, why do we have such a funny name for pressure? Why do we use Pascal? And this is based on also a really important, really um, well known, and really, really famous scientist, Mr. Blaise Pascal. And he lived nearly in the same age as Newton lived in the uh, maybe a bit earlier before Newton in the in the coming 17th century, and he invented a lot. Yeah, he did a lot of good work. He was a great mathematician, ma ma mathematical scientist. Yeah, he invented a lot of things. But let me say. Why, why has he done all this mathematics? Yeah, he, he did it not. He did it for fun. Yeah, it was for him a pleasure to to do such things. He was a genius, but he also made a lot of fluid dynamic simulations. Yeah, and I, I say simulations now. You tell me, yeah, he had no computers. Uh, why do you say simulations? But uh, I want to be honest they already had computers in this time, in the 16th century. And they were built more or less mechanically. The so-called Pascaline from the year 1652 was built for his mathematical calculations. And you can imagine today our supercomputers, if we have high CPU numbers, we have to pay a lot of money. And we did not pay this for fun. We pay uh, the amount of money because we want to calculate a problem. We want to design an airplane or we want to design a bridge or a pipe or a pipeline for for crude oil. And so we buy a, a expensive computer. And this was exactly the same situation in this 16th century. Mr. Blaise Pascal uh, bought a really expensive computer and a calculation machine to calculate, for example, fluid dynamic problems, to build bridges and pipes or, or weapons and, and um, all these facilities. Okay, so maybe I want to, um, yeah, to introduce to you that 
The guys in this former time, the scientists, had the same problems as we today. Yeah? They needed money, they had to build to solve problems. Okay, and come back to our pressure yeah, that was named after Mr. Pascal. Here we have here a surface, we have an acting force which, was, which comes from the pressure. It's really important to calculate the areas and the area can be a bit complicated. Sometimes it can be bended and that's sometimes not so easy to calculate the, how the pressures act. Okay, 